Welcome to my Journey of Faith Radio. I'm so glad you joined me today. I'm excited to introduce you to my guest today, Leanne Garfius. Is that how you say your name? Yes. Well, welcome. It's great to be here and to be talking with you this morning. Well, I loved your book is the first thing I want to tell you. It's called Rocking Ordinary, and once I picked it up, I really couldn't put it down. I read it in a weekend. And the interesting thing to me was how often it changes gears. I started out reading it thinking, this is hilarious. Oh, yeah, this is funny. And then all of a sudden it sort of takes this downward turn, and it, it really took me on a lot of emotional highs and lows. But I guess that may describe your life. Yes, and I think it describes a lot of women's lives. We try to have joy and to make the most of the hilarious things that happen to us every day, but we still have to deal with a lot of pain and So I wanted to really touch into those um, instances and empower women to move beyond them to God's best in their lives. And you talk so much about how God just uses ordinary people, and he does. We have this misconception that, that God is using the big celebrities or the important people or the obvious leaders. But in reality, it's these ordinary moments in our lives, our intimate relationships, our day in and day out, that makes the biggest impact in eternity. It's just so easy to forget that. It is. And, and you know, one of the things you said in your, in your book that I underlined, and I, I wrote down so many things, but it says, I just need to know this all matters. Right. I think it's just that it's that lack of perspective or even even though we have faith and we trust that God is using our everyday, there's still this bombardment from media and social media and Christian celebrity culture that makes us think if we don't have a title or a multitude following us or millions of people liking and sharing our wisdom, then we're not making a difference. But that isn't the truth. And so I just wanted to give myself some tangible proof that God is using these every days and then to be able to offer that to other women who just want a little more hope, a little more proof that that these small moments really matter. And one of the things you said in the book, which I'd just like for you to discuss what you mean by this, you said, we are a race of very popular hermits. It's become easy in our generation to make social media friends or to... Um, have a lot of acquaintances on Facebook or to just retweet things that that we find interesting or to just collaborate on Pinterest, but the real life relationships are what scare us to death. We would rather make a few dozen strangers our Facebook friends than reach out to the new person at church or try to forge a relationship with an acquaintance that we have on the soccer field or in the grocery store that we pass all the time and smile and nod, but we don't know their name. and We haven't really developed a relationship with them. That's so true. I think that's so true. And I think there are definitely some advantages and benefits to social media, but it just cannot replace those authentic relationships that we have in our lives. Oh, I'm with you. I am not about to give up my Facebook habit. <laughs> I love it to death. <laughs> but I've been really challenged over the last um, several months to make sure that I'm investing in the real flesh and blood women around me and um, forging those relationships because I need them. I need real life friends and ironically they do too but we're all stuck in this pattern of being afraid of wondering what they think of me or just imagining criticism in our head and just not reaching out and saying do you want to go to lunch? They're just waiting. The other woman is waiting just like we are to just be invited. It's interesting that you would say that because I'm doing a series on my blog right now about friendship, and that's one of the very things I talk about is that we sit home, think everybody else is out doing something fun, when in reality they're sitting home thinking everybody else is out yeah. doing something fun. Exactly. Or even if they do get invited to that one event that we didn't, and so we see the pictures on social media and we assume everybody's having fun, but in reality they're still wishing that someone at that event Yeah, and one of the things you said is that you were mindful that you were not the most needy person in the room. And I think that is such a beautiful thing. When we become aware 
that even though we're dragging around whatever kind of pain or hurt, that sometimes if we would just look around, we'd be grateful for our own problems, and we would see that other people need us. That's right. It's easy for me to, to feel sorry for myself. I walk into church every Sunday morning tired. I'm always dragged out after a long week, and I just want to sit in my pew and crawl into my shell and hope that God will suddenly rain down blessings and energy on me during the service, but I forget that there's a woman sitting right behind me who's praying for her husband to be healed from cancer, and there's another woman across the aisle who just sent her son away to college and crying because she misses him and she's trying to adjust to this crazy life stage. Everybody has burdens, and we, we do need to recognize our own burdens and bring them to God, but at the same time, we need to realize that we're called one another's burdens. And I can't do that meaningfully if I'm not willing to just reach out and establish a relationship with them. That's so true. You know, and I, that verse that Paul says, I want to know Christ, I want to know the power of his resurrection, and I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. And sometimes it's only through sufferings that we get to know the heart of God. And you have certainly had your fair share of adversity. Like I said, at the beginning, I thought, this is hilarious. This book, you know, I just imagined you just as you are, just perky and energetic and upbeat, but then all of a sudden you talk about your childhood, and it was hard. It was. I didn't think, I didn't necessarily know at the time, because when you grow up, you think that is what is normal, but um, as I became an adult and started my own marriage and my own family is when it really became more difficult to reconcile what does God say about love and what does God say about about how we raise our children, about how we live out the gospel in front of our family, as opposed to um, what I grew up with was physical abuse in our Christian home. So trying to um, separate what is the difference between biblical love and biblical discipline and, and abuse, it was very difficult. It was quite a long road for me. And then to also understand how does, um, in what ways is God's love like and in what ways is it different from a human father's love or a human mother's love? That was very, um, that was quite a journey. And then, um, you know, since I, since the Lord has allowed me to work through these issues and even reconcile with my mother, who was that I struggled with, to be able to reconcile with her and to find forgiveness on both sides and a whole new relationship as we began to understand God's grace and love toward us in the midst of these difficult things. Then I, then I recognized that there are so many other women around me, women that have dealt with sexual abuse or physical abuse in their past or who have gone through extremely difficult marriages or... Um, just or difficult experiences or harassment during their adult life and and there's so much there can be so much shame, so much discouragement, so much disillusionment as we walk through those trials that it challenges our faith. It can just rock our hearts completely until we feel shattered and and question God's goodness and God's love and God's sovereignty over our lives. So I wanted to be able to to, even though it's not a very funny story to tell, I wanted to be able to share enough that women know that I understand that we all have private pain. I understand that we all question why would God allow this in our lives and how can I find his goodness, his love, his grace through it? And how can I heal? How can I offer a hope to the people around me? How can I give a new definition of Christianity? To my husband and to my children. I wanted to be able to reach out effectively. Well, and I think you've done that very well in the book. The book is definitely full of hope for any situation that someone might be facing. And I think you've really sort of latched on and delved into what is love? What does that look like? Because the Bible says they'll know we are Christians by our love, but what is Christ like love? What, you know, how does that flesh out in family? How does that flesh out in the church? How does that flesh out in friendship? And it seems like you've really spent some time poring over that. When I was growing up in, in a very, very conservative Christian circle, it was um, almost 
frowned upon to emphasize God's love like that would make you such a liberal that you didn't understand God's holiness. But so I'm hoping that that some women who might be in that um, kind of culture or that might come from that mindset can understand you can still know God's holiness. You can still respect the inerrancy of God's word and the sufficiency of scripture. You can still know the power of the spirit in your life and be honest about the nitty gritty that we have to deal with and recognize God's supreme love that covers it all and will ultimately um, bring us fully healed and fully glorified um, to be like him, complete in our I love that. And, you know, the Bible says in John that Jesus came full of truth and grace, completely full of truth. And we can't compromise that. And that's not what you're talking about at all. But he also came full of grace. And thank God he came full of grace. Because <laughs> I don't know about you, but I need it every moment. Absolutely. And the more we recognize our own depravity, the more we recognize the sin that we deal with every single day, those failures that, that I talk about in the first part of the book that seem so funny but are actually just these glaring reminders of our own humanity, it's when we see that that we can really celebrate God's grace in the midst of it. I was reading that same passage in John 1 this morning in my devotion, and I like the first part of the verse, John reminds us that the law came by Moses, mm -hmm. and it's that standard of right and wrong that God had to set forth first, and that we recognize in our adult lives every day. We know what is clean and what is dirty, what is folded laundry and what is piled of laundry, what are obedient children and what are running rampant the house children we understand that and then the more we see the futility of trying to control it all on our own the futility of trying to live this picture perfect pinterest life that's when we can come to understand god's grace absolutely and you say in there that devotions were not meant to i can't remember exactly how you put it but devotions were not meant to invoke guilt and i think oh. i spent a lot of my life studying my Bible or reading my Bible out of a total sense of duty, and it was miserable. Right. Oh, yeah. You were probably like me. We were taught this formula for devotion. You have to first find, what does the passage say about God? What does the passage say about holiness? What does the passage say I need to change in my life? And then what does the passage tell me that I can that I can um, give thanks to God for? And then you have to write it all down and then memorize the verses. And this is the formula to having godly devotion. But we can't keep up with this in the real life. God, in, in some seasons of our life, we are barely surviving. There are days when the whole family has the flu, and we can hardly keep our eyes open. And there are days when, when the family calendar is so packed, it's all we can do to be less than 20 minutes late to the next event. <laughs> so, so those times that when our relationship with God is reduced to those simple, help me now, God, not to kill anyone around me, <laughs> that's still part of our walk of faith, just as much as those seasons when we walk through the valleys and we're cleaning the scripture and we're spending extra time in his word. So just like we see this in the Bible, so many times there, the great men of God will have times when they are running from one event to another, from one sermon to the next, and then they are taking And even Christ himself was that way. When he was ministering to people, ministering to people, ministering to people, he didn't even have anywhere to lay his own head down. And then he goes away from the crowd and prays to his father and finds some alone time. And it's this up and down journey that we, in our own spiritual lives, that we have to make peace with, not condemn ourselves for, but instead use it as part of our walk of faith, as part of our knowing God's power in our life. I think so, and I think it's about relationship. I know, I don't know if it was just where I grew up or if it was just what I understood or perceived, but I thought that Christianity was about this list of do's and don'ts, and, and honestly, I just really wasn't very good at it, and so, and, and kind of walked away from it in a sense for a while until I discovered that that's, that's not what it was at all. It's about a, a living relationship. Well, I was 
the times. I <laughs> It is. It's motivated by love instead of a sense of duty. And, you know, I love that phrase, says, this is love, God, love people. And you talk a lot about relationships with people. And I want you to tell us about Wild Bob. I love the analogy of <laughs> Wild Bob. Yes. Well, this, um, I, I have come across a couple times in my life, and I with her 
her wounds on her own. But there, it's hard for us sometimes when it's someone that we love to be able to step back and and just do our ministry. Well, and I think that's a perfect example of what you said when I said that part of the book was funny and and it's really serious because that cracked me up when you called it a raccoon, cat, bob, whatever it was. But then you, you go to such a serious place with it. And another place that you did that was in Chapter 4. It's, it's titled The Most Important Part. And it says a chapter with such a title can only be about one thing, right? Food, because eating is number one. I love to eat. I've been eating my entire life several times a day as though my very existence depended on it. I love that. But then you take it and you talk about how we are starving. When you're hungry, all you can think about is food. But when you're when your soul is starving, how you have to go to the only source of fulfillment. Exactly. And it's so hard for us to do because when 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 we are hurting, when we are discouraged, when we are anxious, it's easy for me to pick up my big look. I have my big Tupperware of snacks right here next to me. <laughs> And stuff my face while while I am texting my husband and simultaneously texting my best friend and posting woe is me on social media and just and crying and watching daytime television. I can do all of that, which is not helpful. When instead, I need to be craving that deeper relationship with God that you were just talking about and digging into Him and. You said it's like stuffing your faith instead of stuff, stuffing your soul, and exactly. and I think that is is that hit home with me, and and I'm sure it will with a lot of people, and and on along those same lines, in one chapter you talk about when we have problems we go to man's solutions, and I'm telling you right now I have been led straight off the edge of a cliff that way. Um, you can get a lot of advice from books, you can get a lot of advice from experts and professionals. You can get a lot of advice from the internet, which is terrifying. But ultimately, man's solutions are going to come up short. And I love how you challenge readers to just get in the scriptures because that's been my life's mantra. That has been my lifeline is to be in the word of God. Sometimes I don't realize even how much I'm turning to man's solution I it, instead of the scriptures because we're so bombarded by this philosophy on parenting, on educating our children, on on marriage, on ministry, on business, on um, speaking and writing and, and dealing with people in general. And we don't realize how much the world's philosophy has tainted our thinking unless we're continually going back and saying, wait a minute, what does God say I should do with this difficult person? What does God say I should be? Um, how does God say I should be loving my husband? What does God say about how I should be um, dealing with my children? And it can be like the third or fourth or last thing that we consult instead of the very first thing that we run to. Even though as Christian women, we say that we and we, and we yearn to, we share the, social, the um, verses on Facebook. I do the same thing. But still, when rubber meets the road, the first time an anxiety-provoking message comes our way, the first time our husband calls us and says, I lost my job, the first time um, we have a really bad fight at home, the first thing I do is going to prayer and opening my Bible, that is very convicting to me. It's not. I'm not. It's something that I'm still working on and still trying to grow in. You know, I, I we talked with a friend the other day, and she she recently actually got a divorce, and I had no idea, and I was I was shocked, and I said, well, I had no idea anything was going on, and she said, well, you know what, I read something that said, are you praying about it as much as you're talking about it? And so she said, I just shut up, and I was like, whoa, that's really powerful because, you know, I I will probably pray about it about a tenth as much as I'll talk about an issue. It is. And I think, you know, sometimes following Christ just makes no sense whatsoever. Oh, that's why it's called faith. <laughs> and and sometimes the words of wisdom from the Bible are totally counterintuitive. 
and opposite to man's wisdom. Absolutely, for so many reasons. Not just, not only because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts, but even more because our we we forget how touched by the curse our own mind and our own desires are, and we forget that we have no good within us and that we can do no good thing apart from him. So we start relying on our gut instincts, but our gut instincts is often counter. Just like you said, exactly counter to what It is. And we have so much information at our fingertips. You know, we can just hop on the Internet and Google something and whatever the search engine feeds us, you know. And a lot of people don't realize that a search engine feeds you what they think you want to hear. Exactly. And so will social media. You will get support for any decision you make. That's right. Right. I think that's terrifying. We really, really have to guard our hearts through that. So, uh, now, how long has your book been out? Since June. Since June. Okay. Yes. So, so it's, it's relatively brief, but it seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I've, gotten very, I've gotten too used to it. I have to remind myself every day, wait a minute, this is a really cool thing. <laughs> it's a book. It is a cool thing. So, uh, just tell our listeners where they can find you and, and, and a little bit about where they can find the book. Absolutely. Well, you can, you can connect with me at lagarfias.com. It's L-A-G-A-R-F, like Frank, I-A, S like Sam. I have an unusual last name. So, it's lagarfias.com. It's where I blog regularly on Christian living and family and books and writing and homeschooling. And um, you can find my book. It's on Amazon and it's on ChristianBook.com. But if you order it directly from my publisher at NLTG.com, and then you can just search Rocky Ordinary and it will pop right up, you will get the ebook version free with your order. And they usually have the best price, too. So it's a really good deal if you order it directly from the publisher. And also, a really cool opportunity we had was to develop a small group. Um, guide. So it has a leader's guide, and there's a DVD, and it really helps to get started with these difficult conversations with your friends. So if you have a book club or a small group that, or just a group of friends who want to talk about how the rubber meets the road in, their, in your Christian life, um, this is a great way to be able to enjoy the message together and to meaningfully encourage one another. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll put those links on this post and NLPG stands for New Leaf Publishing Group. I'll just say that because I think it's easier to remember. And I think doing this with a group of friends is an awesome idea because it would take you to a new depth in a safe way with with good guidelines and boundaries. I think this would be a great roadmap for just a group of friends to do. I love that. That was my prayer from the beginning of writing this book, that it would start a conversation. Um, one of the things I talk about is how powerful the two words, me too, Mm -hmm. If a friend has is going through a difficult a difficulty or wrestling with a temptation, to be able to say me too, I totally understand that my laundry stinks too. That's <laughs> powerful, and that really it helps you be able to meaningfully pray for one another and encourage one another in the Lord. So that's what I wanted to see happen. I think us. so. Well, I think I could talk to you probably for another hour, but our time is up. So I just thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, this is. All right, well, thanks for being on my journey of faith.